So we looked at some interesting NLP tasks already, uh, things like part of speech tagging and parsing. Now we're going to look at a few others. Let's start with information extraction. So information extraction is the task of uh, reading a sentence and extracting named entities such as people and places and organizations and also relationships between them. For example, the CEO of a company and so on. Let me run you through a specific example now. Suppose that you want to build a database of companies and how uh, different rating agencies see them. So in the first example here, we have Wells Fargo, which is a major bank uh, that cuts PPD Inc. to market perform. So market perform is a rating for company. This is some very useful information for investment people. PPD Incorporated is the name of a company. Cuts is the actual action that is taking place here. So Wells Fargo is lowering the rating of this company to the next level down. Let's look at some more examples. China Southern Air upgraded to overweight from neutral, according to HSBC. So here the bank, again, it's shown in red, it's HSBC. It has upgraded now, that means uh, changed the rating in a positive direction of a company, the company's China Southern Air. The new rating is overweight and the old rating is neutral. So for the first time we have the old rating. So if we look at a few more examples, we'll get an idea how this works. There is a ratings institution, typically a bank, that changes a rating of a company from a rating to some other rating. And you can see that this kind of concept can be expressed in many, many different ways. You see the colors move all over the place. Uh, you can also have uh, things like uh, uppercase and lowercase. You can have uh, missing fields, for example, in the most recent example here about Baird cuts KIOR incorporated to underperform rating. We know the new rating, but we don't know the old rating, and so on. So the goal of an information extraction system would be to read sentences like these, to understand the different players, to understand the different named entities, the different ratings, and to be able to represent this whole information in the form of a table that can be later used by people who understand databases for uh, whatever decisions that they need to make with it. So the output of an information extraction would look like, like this. There is a relation that takes, in this case, seven arguments, a date or time, a ticker, like a, which is the stock ticker of the company, the company name, the source, which, or the source of the upgrade or downgrade, uh, the old rating, the new rating, and then the direction of the change. Now, the direction of the change was not explicitly listed in the previous uh, sentences, but it can be inferred from the verb, like cut or upgrade. Okay, so another task in natural language processing is semantics and semantics analysis. So semantics deals with logical representations of sentences such as first order logic. It is also used to represent inference. For example, uh, we can say that if uh, X is the mother of Y, that means that X is a parent of Y. And semantic analysis is one of the hottest areas of natural language processing these days. Uh, it will be very interesting to see how far it can go in the near future. So here's a relevant problem to semantics from NACLO. It's called Bertrand and Russell, a 2014 problem by Ben King. You can download it from this website, and when you're done solving it, you can check for the solution. The solution of the Bertrand and Russell problem is shown here. Another natural language processing task is reading comprehension. So here's an example from a paper by Anand et al. from 2000. The task here is to read a document, such as the one shown here. Uh, it's titled Mars Polar Lander, Where Are You? And then it has a couple of short paragraphs, followed by some reading comprehension questions. For example, where on Mars was the spacecraft supposed to touch down? Or what did the Mars Global Surveyor do? So the goal of this kind of uh, research is to build systems that can answer questions like this by understanding the meaning of those paragraphs. This is another example of text understanding. Uh, you have some sort of a word puzzle. Those used to appear on the GRE tests many years ago. So there are four bungalows in our cul de sac. They're made from four different materials. And then you have some constraints like Mr. Scott's bungalow is somewhere to the left of the wooden one, and the third one along is brick, and so on and so forth. And then you have to answer questions like who lives where and what is their bungalow made from. So obviously it takes some sophisticated natural language processing to be able to solve puzzles like this. 
Another interesting task in natural language processing is word sense disambiguation. As I said earlier, words may have multiple senses, and when they're used in a particular uh, sentence, you have to figure out what sense was intended there. So if you see a sentence like, the thieves took off with 100 gold bars, what does the word bar mean? It's pretty obvious to a human that it means uh, pieces of gold or uh, chunks of gold, but the computer doesn't know this before it performs word sense disambiguation. As far as it's concerned, they may have stolen 100 drinking establishments or perhaps 100 measures of a song. So the task of word sense disambiguation is to take a word in the sentence, look at its context, and determine which of the senses in WordNet or in a dictionary was meant. So uh, just to remind you, uh, words like bar can be very ambiguous. Here I have an excerpt from WordNet, uh, which we'll discuss in more detail later, that shows you uh, all the different senses of bar as a noun. Uh, in addition to the one that we just mentioned, it can also have a meaning as a legal association. It can also mean to prevent something from happening or to blockade a route and so on. So word sense disambiguation is very important for many different other natural language tasks, for example, for machine translation, because very often a word that is ambiguous in one language may be translated differently in a target language. So let's look at a few examples. In English, the word play is ambiguous. It can mean to play a sport, such as Paul plays soccer. If we want to translate this sentence in French, we would have to use O, which is a preposition slash article combination, to indicate that the person is playing a sport. But if you translate it differently from uh, playing a musical instrument, you have to use a different form of this uh, structure. So you have to use the preposition DE followed by the article LA. So every time you have an instrument, you have to use DE. Every time you have a sport, you have to use A, which in this case happens to be uh, turned into O. Let's look now at the translation of an ambiguous word, wall, from English to German. So in German, the basic uh, translation of the word wall is Wand. However, in the case of the Great Wall of China, uh, the translation is Mauer, as in die Chinesische Mauer. So we need to know in advance that we have this particular sense of wall in English to be able to translate this sentence uh, or this phrase properly in German. Even in Spanish, the word wall can be translated in many different ways, depending on whether it's an internal wall or an external wall, like the uh, wall that separates several buildings. The next task in natural language processing is called named entity recognition. In named entity recognition, you have a sentence such as the one shown on the left. Wolf, uh, currently a journalist in Argentina, played with Del Bosque in the final years of the 70s in Real Madrid. So here, what we want to figure out is what are the different named entities. People such as Wolf and Del Bosque, Del Bosque uh, names of organizations, in this case, the soccer club Real Madrid, and also countries such as Argentina. So the output of a typical named entity recognition system is shown on the right. It tells you that Wolf is a person. B-PER means that this is the beginning of a person. The next line has a comma and the label O, which means it's something else, other. So that means that Wolf is a single word person. Argentina is labeled as a location, and it's again single word. Del Bosque is labeled as a person. And the labels that the name entity recognition system assigns to the individual words are B-per for beginning of a person, I-per, which means inside a person. And then since the next label is O, we know that there are no other words that are part of this person. And finally, we have Real Madrid, which is an organization. The first word is labeled as beginning of organization. The second word is inside organization. And then we stop. If you're interested in uh, this topic in more detail, we'll cover it later in this course. But in the meantime, you can look at the two uh, URLs below for two online demos of named entity recognition systems, which allow you to type in entire sentences, and then they will label the output with uh, the different named entities involved. Uh, here's another demo of a system called Abner, uh, developed at the University of Wisconsin, which is specifically used for named entity recognition in the biological domain. You can see that it uses different colors to indicate, for example, names of genes and cells and receptors and proteins, RNA, and so on. This information is extremely valuable when you want to build a system that can understand biomedical papers. 
The next task in natural language processing is called semantic role labeling. It turns out that verbs have arguments, some of which are required and some, which are no, some of which are not required. And those arguments can appear in many different orders in the sentence. So the verb accept has multiple arguments. The most important one, A0, is the acceptor, the person doing the acceptance. A1 is the accepted thing. A2 is from whom the thing was accepted. A3 is an attribute. And then you can also have additional modifiers for modality and for negation. So the goal is to start with a sentence like, he wouldn't accept anything of value from those he was writing about, to recognize that the main verb here is accept, and then to identify which other words should be connected to each of the different arguments of the verb accept. So A0 in this case is the acceptor, the word he, the thing accepted A1 is anything of value, and a2 or accepted from is those he was writing about. Again, we will talk about semantic role labeling in more detail later in the semester, but in the meantime, you can look at an online demo at the University of Illinois shown here. Another task in natural language processing is coreference resolution. Coreference resolution has to do with understanding when two phrases are meant to refer to the same person or entity. The, those are uh, typically used in discourse uh, structures so that you avoid repetition. In the first example here, you have Barack Obama visited China, period. You could have said Barack Obama met with his Chinese counterpart, but that would be repetitive. And instead you say the U.S. president met with his Chinese counterpart. And you mean that the U.S. president core refers to Barack Obama. That's why I'm using the same color to represent the two. Now, if you want to build a summarization system or question answering system, you don't want to think that Barack Obama and the US president are different people. You want those two to be linked together. So if I ask who met with his Chinese counterpart, you would be able to say Barack Obama. So the task of co-reference resolution is to identify expressions that refer to the same entity in discourse and to link them together. Uh, this can actually be a very tricky task because in addition to pronouns, which is the most typical example for coreference resolution, you can have noun phrases like in the first example here, the US president. You can have even more complicated structures. For example, Cynthia went to see her aunt at the hospital, period. She was scheduled for surgery on Monday. She here is a pronoun that could co-refer to either Cynthia or her aunt. Well, you really have to use a lot of semantics and word knowledge to figure out that it was the aunt who was scheduled for surgery. It's very unlikely that somebody who is scheduled for surgery would go visit another person in the hospital. That would be very counterintuitive. So the goal of the co-reference resolution system here would be to look at the ambiguous uh, reference for she and relate it back to her aunt rather than Cynthia. Co-reference uh, can be in two forms. It can be anaphoric or cataphoric. Let me explain what those two words mean. Anaphoric uh, means that the uh, mention of the entity happens first, and then another expression is used to refer back to an entity that has been introduced before. So in the previous example, she appears after her aunt. Now, cataphora or cataphoric relation is when the pronoun or the reference is introduced first before the entity itself is introduced. So this happens less frequently than anaphora, but it still exists and uh, computer systems have to understand how to deal with it. So an example of that is because he was sick, Michael stayed home on Friday. In this case, Michael is the entity. He refers to it, but it is used before introducing the entity. So again, those cases can be very tricky for natural language processing systems to deal with. Uh, there are many other interesting aspects of natural language processing that have to be addressed if you want to build an entire system. So for example, uh, ellipses, parallelism, and underspecification all go together. Ellipses is when a certain word is missing from a sentence because it's implied and it can be understood from the context. So when I say Chen speaks Chinese, period, I don't. What I really mean is Chen speaks Chinese, I don't speak Chinese, but I'm using ellipses to skip speak Chinese, but I can use the parallelism between the two sentences to understand that those words are missing. And we can also use parallelism in the next example. Santa gave Mary a book and Johnny a toy. So in this case, 
uh, we can infer that Santa gave Johnny a toy, even though that is not explicitly said in the sentence because of the parallel structure. So this is the end of the second section on NLP tasks and applications. We're going to continue with some more uh, in the next segment.